some ten centuries after Augustine was called on to salvage the Christian church from the ruins of the Roman Empire, Blaise Pascal took upon himself the task of defending the Christian faith against the arrogance and pride of those who believed they could live without God or mould his purposes to their own. In the France of the Bourbon kings, Pascal was confronted with the Renaissance and the Reformation. He, a man of the Renaissance par excellence himself, avid to extend the frontiers of knowledge, standing on the threshold of science as we know it today, and aware as no one among his contemporaries was of its fabulous potentialities. Who better qualified then to expose the pretensions of science than so eminent a scientist and so celebrated a mathematician? to point the contrast between man standing alone in an illimitable universe and man gathered into the human family of a loving God. is only a reed, the feeblest thing in nature, but he's a thinking reed. It's not necessary for the entire universe to take up arms in order to crush him. A vapor, a drop of water is sufficient to kill him. But if the universe crushes him, man would still be nobler than the thing which destroys him because he knows that he's dying. And the universe, which has him at his mercy, is unaware of it. Thus, more than three centuries ago, Pascal, in his great work, The Pensée, defined man's superiority to nature. If ever there was a thinking reed, it was Pascal himself. In his short life, he died when he was only 39, he established himself as an outstanding mathematician, scientist, and inventor to the point that it was considered by no means out of the way to compare him with Aristotle. On this mountain, for instance, an experiment was carried out under Pascal's direction, which established the existence of atmospheric pressure, thereby laying down the foundations of the modern science of hydraulics. Again, over there in Clermont-Ferrand, where Pascal was born, is the mechanical calculator or, as he called it, machine arithmetic, that he designed on the same essential lines as today's computer. In the field of pure mathematics, he's one of the great names, an astonishing enough yield in all conscience for one abbreviated life, any item of which would have been enough to ensure that Pascal continued to be remembered. It's not, however, for any and or all of these achievements that his fame has grown through the centuries since his death, or for that matter, that I make my tiny contribution to it on a medium that certainly would have fascinated him, but for something that I, like many, many others before me, consider immeasurably greater, his sublime defense of faith as the one sure guide to reality and of the Christian religion as showing Western man the way out of the cul-de-sac into which science must infallibly lead him. The cul-de-sac of science has only become the more evident during the 20th century, when science has advanced further towards exploring and explaining the nature and the mechanisms of matter than in all the rest of recorded time. The spectacle which Pascal imagined, and we've actually seen, of our Earth as a tiny revolving ball in the immensity of space, 
one among innumerable others, great and small, far from as he hoped, turning us to God, has served rather to sharpen than intensify the idiot conceit of technologically advanced nations. Just let me close off with this one thing. I, I was thinking, as, as, as you know, as you came down, and we knew it was a success, and it had only been eight days, just, just a week, a long week, that this is the greatest week in the history of the world since the creation. In other words, as Pascal would foresaw would happen, science, like the old pagan gods, has come to belong rather to man's quest for power than for truth. Man a thinking reed, yes, but his very thought processes only induce him to realize the limitations of thought as his preoccupation with time leads him to diminish the importance of eternity, turning it into nothingness and nothingness into eternity. So the most brilliant scientist of his time denounced not the methods, but the vain glorious pretensions of science and an incomparable intellect devoted itself to showing how very little the intellect can do. Know then, proud man, Pascal wrote, what a paradox you are to yourself. Humble yourself, impotent reason. Be silent, dull-witted nature, and learn from your master your true condition, which you don't understand. Listen to God. See the earth as a point compared with the vast circles it describes. Stand amazed that this circle itself is only a tiny point in relation to the course traced by the stars revolving in the firmament. That the whole visible world is no more than an imperceptible speck in the ample bosom of nature. Having thus lost himself in creation's vast perspectives, Pascal insisted, man may find himself again in a God who has counted the hairs of his head and can't see a sparrow fall to the ground without concern. In place of his great contemporary Descartes' pursuit of an abstract intellectual truth, Pascal sets the personal drama of individual men seeking God. Instead of Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Pascal says, I look for God, therefore I found him. Modern medicine concentrates on the body its organs and its mechanisms. It seeks to demonstrate its own omnipotence and finds its inspiration in reason, in the mind, rather than in faith. Yet, Pascal observes, how few things there are which can be proved. Proofs only convince the mind. Who's ever been able to prove that tomorrow will come and that we shall die? and what could be more generally believed. In short, we must rely on faith when the mind has once perceived where truth lies in order to quench our thirst and color our minds with a faith that eludes us at every moment of the day. At Lourdes, the pilgrims chant their miseraries, laying their infirmities and disabilities before God and hoping to be vouchsafed the spiritual strength to endure and perhaps even overcome them. In their meek acceptance of affliction, 
their readiness to say and mean, thy will be done, they display the true greatness of man, which, Pascal writes in the Pensee, is great insofar as he realizes that he's wretched. A tree doesn't know its own wretchedness. Over France, in Pascal's time, loomed the formidable figure of Cardinal Richelieu, who combined in his single person the power of the church and the state. No doubt the author of the Pensee had him in mind when he wrote so scathingly of the pretensions of earthly authority, while at the same time being fully aware of its necessity if laws were to be enforced and order to be maintained. Like all mystics, Pascal was at heart an anarchist, who nonetheless realized that as long as men needed rules to live together, they would also need power to enforce them. Like Saint Augustine, he longed for his citizenship in the city of God, but meanwhile was content to accept the conditions of living in the earthly city. It was to Richelieu that Pascal's father, Etienne Pascal, owed his appointment to high administrative positions in the service of the state. And when, for a while, he fell out of favor, and had to stay away from Paris to, for fear of being arrested, it was his youngest daughter, Jacqueline, who, at the age of 12, successfully pleaded for her father with the Cardinal. The children never went to school, and Etienne Pascal, a true man of the Renaissance, educated them himself at home on carefully thought-out principles. When uh, Etienne Pascal was entrusted with the thankless task of collecting in Normandy the exorbitant taxes which Richelieu was bound to impose to pay for the king's wars, his son used very touchingly to sit up with him night after night, working on his desolate accounts. It was this experience which first turned Pascal's attention to the possibility of inventing a calculating machine. Again, when by chance the family came into contact with a Jansenist priest, they all responded together to this evangelical movement within what had become under Richelieu's dominance in many respects, a corrupt and worldly church. Etienne Pascal did not live to see the full involvement of his children in Jansenism. But all three of them, Jacqueline most ardently, her brother trailing along behind her, and Gilbert more sedately, remained faithful to its higher standards of piety, charity, and devotion.
The Jansenist movement, named after a bishop of Ypres, was strongly supported at the Abbey of Port Royal, whose mother superior, Mère Angélique, belonged to the Arnaud family, all of whom were ardent followers of Jansen. Jansenism attracted such gifted, pious people, as well as aristocrats, like the Duc de Rouenet, a great friend of Pascal, who in his early days had a taste for consorting with the nobility. It was some of these aristocratic Jansenists who became known as the gentlemen hermits. It was here at Port Royal that some of the most dramatic and decisive exchanges in Pascal's life took place with his sister Jacqueline, whom he loved so dearly, and who, when their father died, had insisted on becoming a nun at this famous convent. Pascal's feelings about her renunciation of the world were mixed. First of all, he approved, then he opposed, and then he sourly acquiesced. At one point, they were involved in a sordid money row, which had Pascal shouting angry that under no circumstances would he agree to his sister's share of their inheritance being handed over to the convent as her dowry when she took her final vows. This particular row ended in Pascal handing over more to the convent than was required thereby incidentally quite considerably reducing his own income. Such rows, in my experience, are never about what they're about. And I doubt very much whether either of them really cared much about the money as such either way. Jacqueline, who was a girl of quite exceptional gifts, in some ways surpassing those of her brother, and whose dazzling attractiveness shines out across the intervening three centuries, in my opinion, went to the heart of the matter when she upbraided her brother by saying, if you don't possess the strength to follow me, at least don't hold me back. Don't show yourself ungrateful to God for the grace he's given to a person whom you love. In other words, it was envy and pride that were gnawing away at Pascal, not cupidity at all. It riled him deeply that he should go on being held a prisoner of the world that she had so gracefully and thankfully cast off. A servitude he found increasingly burdensome. In the event, of course, Pascal did turn up when Jacqueline took her final vows. She could see him through this grill, in silhouette, on his knees, but still looking cross. 
Actually, as I'm sure she correctly divined, he was on the run. And she resolved then and there to press him hard with a view to making of him a Christian saint instead of a mere brilliant scientist and celebrity. Thenceforth, in their now almost daily exchanges across the grill, it was Jacqueline who made the going until about the middle of September 1654, as she wrote to her sister Gilbert, he opened up his heart to me in a way that could not but fill me with pity. He admitted, she went on, that in the midst of his many occupations and of the pleasures of the fashionable world by which he seemed to set so much store, he was conscious of an overwhelming urge to abandon everything. It was an important admission, but still, though he felt this extreme distaste for the follies and distractions of society, there was no corresponding inclination to turn to God. How truly attached to worldly things he must have been, Jacqueline reflected, thus to resist the graces God sends him and to turn a deaf ear to his appeal. They broke off to attend Vespers. Pascal under the small visitor's cupola and Jacqueline behind the grill, praying as I'm sure she'd never prayed before, that the grace so vividly growing in her famous brother would lead him to take the last remaining step into God's arms. Some five weeks later, he took it on the night of November 23. We have, as it happens, Pascal's own account written in his own hand of this experience in the famous memorial, which was found sewn into his clothing at the time of his death. He treasured it and kept it on his person always. His sister Gilbert piously preserved it, crumpled and faded among his papers. A unique and intensely moving document which, like some spiritual seismograph, reflects in its very strokes and flourishes the fluctuations of his state of mind when he was writing it. We may imagine him sitting at home in the evening. He opens his New Testament at the account of the Passion, and his eye fastens on Peter's thrice-repeated denial that he was an associate of Jesus. As he reads the cock crows, but not for Peter, for him, Pascal. Peter, confronted with his disloyalty, wept, and so does Pascal, realizing that he too has separated himself from Christ. What desolation, what darkness. Then suddenly deliverance comes. He understands that he too can be forgiven, but he is forgiven. He looks at the clock and sees it is half past 10. Seated at his desk, he begins his memorial. First, a tiny cross at the top of the paper, followed by the date, Monday, 23rd November, 1654, Feast of St. Clement, Pope and Martyr, and others belonging to the martyrology. Then the word fire, signifying the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, but not, he adds, to rub in the point, the god of the philosophers and scholars. This, I'm sure, with an eye on Descartes. Now come the triumphant words, certainty, certainty, emotion, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, diem meum et diem vestum, thy God shall be my God, oblivion of the world and of everything except God, his ecstasy is in his pen. The slanting letters proclaim it, like steeples reaching into the sky. Joy, 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 tears of joy. Now, like St. Paul and Augustine in similar circumstances, Pascal had a craving for solitude, which he found at Port Royal's sister foundation, Port Royal des Champs, 
outside Paris. Contrary to what's often suggested, the conversion that Pascal so ecstatically described in the memorial did not result in his abandoning all his worldly interests. For instance, he continued with his uh, scientific studies and researches. And even as late as the last year of his life, he was responsible for starting what was in effect Paris's first public transport system. Moreover, the most mundane of his writings, the famous provincial letters, were undertaken almost by chance after his conversion and involved him as one of the principals in the bitter controversy then raging between the Jesuits and the Jansenists. The Jesuits favoured tempering the severities of Christian doctrine and practice in order to make them more palatable. On the other hand, the Jansenists were insistent that the service of Christ still required the renunciation of worldly pleasures and prizes. Pascal, in any case, would have been temperamentally on the Jansenist side. He loved the pleasures and the prizes much too much to tolerate any mitigation of their ill repute. With Port Royal in effect the headquarters of militant Jansenism, and his beloved de Jacqueline, one of the most ardent of the militants, he soon became the anonymous an enormously impressive spokesman. Using to the full his splendid gift of irony, deployed in a lucid, flexible style more reminiscent of Jonathan Swift than Thomas Aquinas, Pascal in his provincial letters mercilessly lambasted the Jesuits. It was a superb performance, greatly admired by the reading public, who flocked to get the letters as they came out. Some of the stater Jansenists, despite or perhaps because of their great popularity, found them a shade disconcerting. The Jesuits, of course, abominated them. The controversy which gave rise to the provincial letters is an everlasting one between those who think that as far as possible we should be allowed to do what we like in this world and those who, like Pascal, conceive it to be the glory and the greatness of man, to look upwards from what he called licking the earth, to survey the destiny that awaits him beyond the ticking of the clocks. Today, the controversy ranges around the concept of what's called situational ethics, whereby an act is right or wrong, not intrinsically, but in relation to its circumstances. As Pascal himself put it, Merely according to reason, nothing is just in itself. Everything there is according to the weather. Now, as in Pascal's time, Jesuits tend to find such a view sympathetic. I suppose that in the present condition of the world and in the various controversies that go on now among theologians and moralists and so on, uh, one could see a repetition almost of the situation that Pascal uh, recognized around him. Um, for instance, in terms of just of human behavior, what is now, I believe, called situational ethics, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. In other words, that our moral mm -hmm. behavior depends mm -hmm. not just on good and evil, but on the actual circumstance. There might be circumstances mm -hmm. right. which would mm -hmm. make, say, adultery. Mm -hmm. a perfectly permissible right. act mm -hmm. and other circumstances in which it would still yeah. be. I think Pascal would have been pretty strongly against this, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose you're familiar with that, that, that in traditional Christian morality, you judge the morality of an action by the object 
by the intention and by the circumstances. Yes. And the circumstances are considered as the third element, third and less important element. While in situational ethic, roughly considered, the ones by Fuchs, for example, by Fletcher, first manner, eh, the circumstances were all, so that you had no rule, no absolutes, no principle. I don't agree at all with that, and You're I would not be a supporter of Fletcher. No, 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 I wouldn't be. But today, I would be more of a supporter of Fletcher because he's evolved a lot. And let's say some Jesuits are coming back to the Fletcher position, especially in the United States at the present time, because there is quite a difference between what happened then and what happens now. They insist on the basic commitment to faith, love of God, and love of neighbor, and then comes the circumstances. To my mind, this is much more human. It might be more human, Father, but I think if I were sort of speaking on behalf of Pascal, uh, surely it is a contributory cause of the moral dissolution which uh, threatens our society. In other words, it, to the ordinary mortal man, if you say to him, well, I can't tell you, I can't give you a code of behavior. I can't even give you absolutes of good and evil. I can't give you God and the devil, but I can say to you, you must love your neighbor and so on, and that in the light of that, you must consider each separate moral situation that arises. I can't see poor old mankind evolving much virtuous behavior out of that. Uh, well, I would <coughs> react that way to my mind. First. There is a distinction between being perfect and being moral. Eh? You agree certainly, on that. Certainly. Being moral means that you recognize what's wrong in you. Being perfect is the effect of grace when you follow it. Right. Uh, at that moment, I see, well, uh, if suppose the Christian churches decided to be just as radical as the Jansenists were in the 17th century, they would turn out to be a ghetto, to my mind, and the influence of Christ. Christ has never been extremely aggressive on human morality. He's been insisting and demanding, but at the same time extremely merciful on the sinners. In what cases? You were thinking of that old woman, the woman taken in adultery. Yes. She's always brought up, and yes. they always leave out nowadays, Father, the end of it, mm -hmm. in which she's told to go away and sin no more. Sin no Have more. you noticed that? That yeah. in the permissive presentations of yeah. this favorite story, mm -hmm. whether in Jesus yeah. Superstar or any other, the last sentence is yeah. always omitted. I agree. But and I think the last sentence is, is the, it's the, last is sentence is the important Certainly. thing. The important Certainly. Thing. The Christian demand for Perfection must not be dropped. That's and right. In a way, the churches could do more, I think, to protect us against what you called as a decadent morality. If but I don't you think, Father, too, again, I, in my role of trying to be Pascal, that um, not only is, it is that necessary, but it's, it's also necessary to insist on this question of behavior. I mean, mm -hmm. the woman taken in adultery, of course, mercy is required, and our Lord constantly uh, displayed that. Mm -hmm. But equally, if there's no code of conduct, mm -hmm. right. then, then right. where are we? Yes, and I agree, and that's so that I wouldn't uh, consider that situational morality today as no code. Eh? No code, they have a code, definitely. For example, the Decalogue, which has been the old Jesuit tradition, as you know, mm. the Dominicans centered their reflection on morality on the three uh, theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, and mm. the four cardinal virtues. Mm. While the Jesuits used the Decalogue traditionally, mm. for, and we still do. But the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, that's right. Would you still endorse them? Certainly, certainly. Mm. But they are the only law this world has ever known, as somebody said. I Cecil B. DeMille is the man who did. <laughs> yes, I'm sure he made this great film. Who wins? It's what everyone always wants to know. But of course, in truly fundamental disputes, like the one between the Jesuits and the Jansenists, between the worldly, and the otherworldly, there are no clear-cut winners and losers. It's perfectly true that the Jansenists, as such, have ceased to exist. Persecution followed the appearance of the provincial letters, and the religious at Port Royal were required to adhere to an equivocal statement of orthodoxy, an exercise in casuistry that killed poor Jacqueline.
or at any rate hastened her early death. Later, on the orders of Louis XIV, the Port Royal of Mère Angélique and the gentlemen hermits was destroyed. And all we can do today is trace what it once was in these spare ruins, all that remains of its material existence. As for the Society of Jesuits, they can be said to be going strong, or at any rate, going. Now, likewise, this palace of Versailles, which Louis XIV was at such pains to have built at the same time as he was destroying Port Royal, it still stands, though no longer the residence of kings, but a tourist attraction. As for the provincial letters, they hold their place in Pascal's oeuvre, but as literature, or perhaps better, as an early brilliant essay in journalism rather than as an apologia for Jansenism. How then do the accounts work out, the debit and the credit? The answer is that they're still not closed and never can be. Versailles standing is essentially as much a ruin as Port Royal ruin. What Pascal defended can't be lost. What the Jesuits defend is lost already. They build the walls of Jericho which have to be built, but only to fall down when a Pascal blows his trumpet. While they are concerned with tactics, his mind was on strategy. This majestic cathedral of Chartres belongs to a period as far away in time from Pascal as he is from us. It symbolized then, as it does now, the heavenly hopes of those who built it, and stands in all its solidity as an enduring monument to a church which has managed to survive through all the troubled centuries of Christendom. In Pascal's time, as in ours, its continued existence was threatened from without and from within. The Reformation, like the discoveries and pretensions of science today, had challenged its basic premises. And inside the church, there were those, again as they are today, in each case with the Jesuits well to the fore, eager to fall in with the new, trendy intellectual and moral attitudes. Pascal himself was ready to lend his dialectical skill to opposing the innovators and considered himself, to the end of his days, a loyal son of the church, even though he was open to a charge of heresy and only just missed being excommunicated. At the same time, what Pascal was concerned with essentially was not an institutional church or a temporal state, but man himself that fugitive from reality, who must somehow be persuaded to confront his own imperfection and despair and see through them into the bright light of eternity, his true habitat. Since men are unable, he wrote, to cure death, misery, ignorance, they imagine they can find happiness by not thinking about such things. Well, Pascal would set them thinking. Pascal was endlessly fascinated by the ingenuity with which we human beings evade reality, from small, trivial evasions, like these televised buffooneries in the very shadow of Christendom's most splendid monument. What an extraordinary thing it is, he observes in the Pensee, that a man who has suffered some terrible bereavement or got involved in some desperate plot can forget his troubles so easily born to know the universe, 
to sit in judgment and to rule. He's wholly concerned with trivialities. And if he tries to rise above them, he will only be departing from his natural state. Neither angel nor beast, but just man. Then there are the larger evasions of reality, mounted in courts of justice and of kings, on battlefields and in legislatures, in laboratories and universities. So Pascal anatomized our human condition in his great work, The Pensée. In the high tide of his newfound faith, Pascal took upon himself the stupendous task of producing no less than a defense of the Christian religion. It was an audacious undertaking to take, as it were, the contemporary atheist by the scruff of the neck and make him see how mistaken he was in rejecting what alone could save him from boredom and despair. The method he proposed to employ was precisely the same as in his scientific expositions an examination of the evidence, reasoned argument, and the lucid presentation of cogent conclusions. As things turned out, he never got beyond preparing the notes. And his sister, Gilbert, in her charming memoir of him, bemoans the fact that all his labors should thus have been fruitless. She needn't have worried. The notes called pensées have enchanted, infuriated, uplifted, depressed, enlightened, mystified, but always enthralled countless readers from generation to generation, and are today as sparkling as when they were written, and if anything, even more relevant. Indeed, I consider myself that it was a beneficent, if not miraculous circumstance that Pascal was unable to proceed beyond the notes. The full work, had he lived to complete it, might well have been too massive, too definitive, too dogmatic even in its final conclusions to appeal, as the pensée have, to all the stragglers and vagrants like myself, similarly questing. Might it not also have lacked something of the quality I find most delectable? a beautiful scepticism, contrasting so joyously with the sentimentality and credulity of scientific humanism, which actually takes seriously man's ridiculous pretension to shape his own destiny, pursue his own happiness, construct his own well-being. The red robes of our judges, Pascal insists, the ermine in which they swaddle themselves like furry cats, the courts where they sit, the fleur-de-lis, all the august display is very necessary. Likewise, if physicians didn't have cassocks and mules, and professors didn't have square hats and robes four sizes too large, they'd never have been able to fool people. Kings and dons and divines are under a similar necessity to dress up in their preposterous robes and gowns and wigs. Otherwise, we'd see them for what they are, ham actors in an interminable soap opera called History, in which a mighty Roman empire stands or falls on Cleopatra's nose, and whole continents are devastated by wars and revolutions purporting to uphold liberty and enlarge happiness and infallibly destroying both. Plato and Aristotle, when they wrote about politics, were drawing up plans for a madhouse 
whose inmates, mankind, were under the necessity to invent endless diversions to fight off the ennui which would otherwise afflict them and evade confronting the circumstances of their existence which would otherwise plunge them into despair. There's nothing so absurd that it hasn't been said by one philosopher or another, Pascal quotes Cicero as saying. The subsequent centuries have certainly not detracted from the force of this observation, least of all our own. What sort of a creature then was this monster man? What a novelty, what a portent, what a chaos, what a mass of contradictions. What a prodigy, judge of all things, a ridiculous earthworm who is nonetheless the repository of truth, a sink of uncertainty and error, the glory and the scum of the world, a chaos suspended over an abyss, great only in that he knows he's wretched. The very reason on which he so prides himself leads him to conclude that there are an infinite number of things beyond it. Pride separates him from God and induces him to believe that he's a God himself. When he licks the earth, he's cast into the other abyss and seeks his good in sensuality, which is the lot of the animals. Egomania and erotomania, the two sicknesses of the godless, afflict him. In the Pensee, at the very moment of the birth of science as we know it today, Pascal prophesied its downfall, which we're witnessing. As men came to grasp the vast extent and complexity of creation, ranging between the minuteness of the atom and the immensity of the universe, they would become, as he predicted, terrified by the eternal silence of these infinite spaces. A choice would confront them between seeing the whole future of man locked up immutably in his physical being, in Professor Mono's terms, in his genes, and accepting in humility and contrition a role in the mysterious purposes of a loving God. With passionate intensity and the clarity of an evening star shining in a darkening sky, he plumped for the latter choice. If it was a wager, he'd bet on it. If a vigil, he'd watch for it. If a martyrdom, he'd die for it. The alternative to God was nothingness. The way to God revealed by Jesus Christ, who is by his glory all that is great, being God, and is by his mortal life all that is stunted and abject, who assumed his wretched condition in order that he might be in all people and serve as a model for all conditions of men. So Pascal takes us with him along his own arduous mental and spiritual pilgrimage, delivering us at his destination, where we find the intersection of time and eternity in a cross, on which God dies in the person of a man, and a man rises from the dead in the person of God.
Pascal's funeral and burial took place in this church of St. Etienne du Mont on the 21st of August, 1662, at 10 in the morning. Some 50 of his friends and relatives, including, of course, his sister, Gilbert Perrier, gathered here for the ceremony. Pascal had expressed a wish to be buried in a common pauper's grave so that he might lie near the poorest of the poor, who had become so very dear to him, and on whose behalf in the last year of his life he'd sold all his possessions, keeping of his books only two, the Bible and St. Augustine, a very wise choice. The Christian faith performs this miracle of humbling the greatest minds and proudest spirits. And when was there a greater mind or prouder spirit than Pascal's? So that they may experience, even before dying, the joy of losing themselves in the great throng gathered round God's throne. Later, controversies arose as to the attitude Pascal had to the church on his deathbed and about his mental and physical condition. I can't see myself that either point was particularly material. We know that he ardently sought the consolations the church has to offer to the dying, and that the eminent doctors who attended him more than lived up to the reputation for incompetence that Molière was to give them. Surely this suffices. What Pascal bequeathed us to be a permanent possession is, in the Abbe Steinmann's words, the incomparable inventory of the eternal problems that he drew up. Also, his incomparable picture of man, ourselves, confronting an empty, silent, and illimitable universe in which the only choices before him are this emptiness and the crucified Christ. This being so, perhaps it's fitting that the only certain likeness we have of Pascal is his death mask.